the session, uh, the high risk session on high risk myeloma that I took part in, I spoke about the unmet needs and future directions um, of high risk myeloma. Uh, one of the points that I highlighted was that really uh, it is important that we get results on genetic testing for as many patients as we can. We all try to achieve that and I think especially in the larger and better resource centers we are probably very efficient at doing that. But there has been a recent survey that showed that actually in the community there is a very heterogeneous pattern as to how much genetic results and testing patients get. I think what that leads to is that across the community there is a discrepancy. Some people probably consider genetic testing useless or pointless just because they never really get results or can contextualize them uh, with the outcomes that they see in their patients. So one of the markers that we found to be really, really consistent is the co-occurrence of two or more high-risk genetic cytogenetic aberrations. So for example, a T414 and a gain of 1Q or a gain of 1Q and a deletion 70P. That really discriminates a group of patients that have unfortunately um, really worse outcome than the others and it's more marked than if they just have one of these markers, just an isolated gain of 1Q. That's a relatively simple way of actually profiling patients. We know that 15% of patients have a co-occurrence of two markers. And if a fish laboratory that is experienced really aims at profiling all of these lesions, they can identify these patients relatively easily. But it's not very consistent at the moment. Many laboratories still only test for two markers, uh, T414 and deletion 17P, then of course you cannot identify a lot of these patients. Or uh, many laboratories also don't really um, select the tumor cells before their genetic testing and that leads to a false low rate of genetic aberrations. Now what we see very very consistently in large trial cohorts and we have done meta-analyses across several thousand patients and there's more to come later this year that this is consistent across newly diagnosed patients, older patients, younger patients, uh, newly diagnosed patients, relapsed patients. So we, we have here a marker that really identifies 15 percent of patients that consistently should be looked after more carefully. I think there is a lot of um, uncertainty still around, of course, what is the best treatment for these patients. But in our standard practice, we really see uh, just with the standard of care induction therapy, transplant and maintenance therapy, that these patients unfortunately tend to relapse early. And even if there isn't really a standardized treatment yet for these patients, even just looking after them more frequently, so we bring these patients more regularly back, we're probably not increasing the intervals in maintenance of two, two months when we test the power person but we bring them back every month. Because in these patients, we really consistently see that things can happen if they're not closely monitored. Uh, one of the aspects that is a very, very simple one as well, but that can be enacted quite, quite easily for an, in the context of an autologous stem cell transplant, um, stem cells need to be harvested before the transplant. Often that can take time because the resources mean there has to be a delay, a gap. And in the double hit patients, as we call them, those with two or more risk lesions, we just try to keep that as short, as short as possible because we have consistently seen otherwise relapses after induction before transplant in these patients. So um, in addition, we were also discussing whether molecular methods could supersede fish testing. There are actually molecular methods. Uh, one of them uh, that we all know much about is whole genome sequencing. But in a recent analysis um, of a very experienced German genetic laboratory, unfortunately more than half of patients just didn't have enough material for whole genome sequencing to be done. That's different than in the acute leukemias. So if we only use this technique, then half of our patients wouldn't have a result at all. But there are other technologies that, for example, we have used in a prospective trial. One of them is called multiplex ligation dependent amplification. It's a very long word, but MLPA in short. And it uses a fraction of the material that you use for whole genome sequencing. And you get a copy number profile across the whole genome. Likewise, there is gene expression profiling with uh, clinically developed tests, for example, like the 
uh, MM profiler uh, that tests for the Sky92 signature. That doesn't need a lot of RNA and can you tell you something about the translocations, T414, T1416, as well as a gene expression signature that yet adds another layer of risk discrimination. So with these technologies we found in a trial, the optimum uh, trial that we ran in the UK for ultra high risk myeloma, that in a completely unbiased, newly diagnosed you know, group of patients, we could get a result on both tests in 90% of patients. That of course means that we can really then direct therapy far more targeted at that group of ultra high risk patients. We considered both those with two high risk operations, but also those with a gene expression high risk signature, because we found in previous investigations, these patients with the current standards, so for example, revlimid maintenance after transplant, unfortunately do not do well. And we have updated data that we will show later in the year that are very, very encouraging to actually intensify consolidation and maintenance specifically in those patients. So how we see things emerge in the future is potentially that we can allocate our resources to the risk profile that we see uh, through the genetic testing. And that means that allocation of resources can sometimes happen half a year after they're diagnosed. It's very important that you get the diagnosis when they are newly diagnosed correct. Once the tumor is gone with our regimens, they're gone in nearly all patients, you cannot profile the genetics anymore. But you probably want to know the result most after six or seven months after they have started treatment, because that is when you need to decide, should they only have Revlimid on its own? Should they have Revlimid and Velcade? Or even a triplet combination, what we have done in our high-risk trial, which seems to be yet leading to unprecedented results, really. So um, watch this space for meetings later in the year.